This is a Founding Media Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Packing Taste. Today, we're doing things a little bit differently. We're uh, recording live at the Long Center here in Austin, Texas. Um, first, we'd like to thank Richard's Rainwater and Brain Juice for hydrating us and keeping our brains uh, active during a crazy week here. Um, so today we have George Milton, co-founder and CEO of Yellowbird Foods, a kick-ass all-natural hot sauce company that has built quite a community here in Austin and now is nationwide. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, of course, man. Of course. Um, I think we've picked a good day. Uh, it looks gorgeous outside. South by is, is popping off. Um, have you caught any shows? This week? And I have not. I was out of town for the first part of it. Okay. Um, but I will be downtown tomorrow. So I don't have a pass. I don't have a. But you don't need a pass. I don't need a pass. Yeah. <laughs> People just know me. They see me coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, every time. This is probably the fourth year I've done South by, and I've gotten away without a badge. You really don't. There's so many, like, off, off venue things that are that don't require a badge mm -hmm. now that it's really like its own event because music starts it starts wednesday so it's like a five-day thing but it starts kind of the week before and everyone's every bar every venue has a live show right yeah it's great yeah but yep. that's what austin's like all the time yeah true true just on stare on brain juice this week you know <laughs> do you have a do you have any crazy south by stories that we can kind of uh, start off with. Oh man, cool. crazy South by stories. Well, I before I was doing uh, hot sauce, um, I was a bar musician. Oh yeah. So I've played uh, n not not in South by shows, but I've played downtown or like dear in South by in the South by mess. Official, several unofficial. times. Unofficial, always unofficial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a totally unofficial guy. Yeah. So. Well, nice. Um, um which. I was going to ask you about being a musician because I heard that was... Well, ask me about it, man. Yeah, yeah. So that so you started... you The hot sauce stuff kind of started with you being a musician, right? Yeah. I was... I mean, we moved here uh, from Houston mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, and I was a full-time musician at the time. So I didn't come here with the idea to start a business or to make uh, hot sauce for a living. Yeah. So, what instrument? Uh, well, I was I was doing I did a piano bar like dueling piano bar, okay stuff for a long time. Are you familiar with those? There's no, one? no, 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 no. I'm familiar with uh, the piano. Okay, you've <laughs> heard of the piano before. Okay, that's a starting point. Yeah. Um, but so like dueling piano bars, it's like you you got two two folks playing the piano and yes, okay, and they sit okay. across from each other and it's rambunctious and you get people to sing along yeah. and you have people on the stage and there's it's all. I mean, it's all cover music, right? And, and is it, was that like at one place, or were you trying to land gigs all over town? So I did. I played um, when I was. It's hard to take a piano around. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I've tried it, um, but it's uh, so I was doing it at one place for a while. And when I was in Houston, I was uh, playing full time at a place called Pete's, which is in downtown yeah. Houston. Uh, and there's one here too on Sixth Street. Yeah. So I play there. I'm actually playing. Tomorrow night, so I'll be right really? in the middle. Yeah, I'll be right in the middle of all the South by. But I, I was doing that when I moved here, and when I first moved here, I was literally like dragging, not like a, not a piano, but a lot of these like, uh, when you do live piano shows, a lot of it is, is like a keyboard. It's a full length mm -hmm. weighted, you know, eighty eight key, keyboard, um, and you put it in a piano shell, so like a wooden replica. Okay, so you just taking the keys. So you're not bringing the whole soundboard of the piano, yeah. right? Because that's what's like super heavy. Mm -hmm. And then I actually built some like grand piano shells and I would just take, and I had a sound system and I would just travel around. So when I first moved here, I was literally on the road for three out of four weeks of, of the month, you know? On the road here in Austin or going to just cities? Just all over the place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doing bar shows doing you know playing weddings yeah. playing whatever so i moved to austin to play music and i ended up out of town more than here. yeah 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 and you that kind of like i mean trying to land your own gigs and essentially being your own boss as a musician kind of did that give you some sort of 
uh, framework to uh, uh, I think, to the sauces. So I think that being a being a freelance musician because before I did piano bar stuff, I played in bands and I went, you know, I played in bars, which a mm-hmm. lot of that is just a lot of like booking yourself at bars and I don't do a lot of it now anymore. I just, I don't have time for it. I just kind of pick up stuff every now and again. Yeah. So I stay, you know, I can still, I still got it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of being a musician is, is just kind of schlepping around from bar to bar and like, this is why you should hire me. And I'll, you know, I'll come do Wednesday night for free and, you know, just I'll donate the cover or whatever, like just stuff to, it's just a hustle. It's like a nonstop because the, like playing a gig is not the hard part, Mm -hmm. you know, the hard, like 90% of the hard part of being a musician is getting a gig, any gig. And then, you know, get it. And then like getting enough gigs to where you can support yourself or like, you're not completely starving. You can like make a bit of a living and have a place to live and all this sort of stuff. And then, probably another like 8% of the difficulty is like getting your gear there and setting up. And then like once you've got the gig and you have your gear there, like playing is kind of the easy part as long as you like practice. Yeah. So so I was going to say like kind of in business is like you have this problem and that's like the biggest problem, which would be landing the gig. Once you land the gig, then you have, okay, well now I need to get all my gear there and need to make sure it's all working. Yeah, there's analogies, that. man. There's all sorts of yeah, business yeah, analogies. Yeah, yeah. And then once you all the gear, everything's ready, it's like, all right, now I got to make sure that these people love my music. So it's kind of like you finish a problem, tackle the next one. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that, that that flows into what we're doing because so Yellowbird sauce, um, I was making these so- these you know I was making these sauces before we even moved uh, to Austin, and it was it was years. It, w- it was years in the kind of in the process of it becoming a commercial thing. And you were making the habanero one. I was first. just making the habanero one. For yeah. For friends and family. It was just it kind was of ju- the, It was go-to. literally just. So the reason we started it was because we, like, me and my partner, Aaron, mm-hmm. we moved here together. We started the company together. Aaron is your partner and co founder. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and Aaron does. Uh, She's in charge of all of our marketing and branding. She did all of the label design, all Mm -hmm. the bottle design. Um, She, you know, did our website design. So she is, I think she works way harder than I do. But uh, (laughs) she's working right now while I'm here talking to you. Yeah, yeah. um, But the uh, initially when I was making this stuff, I was, so I used to use, um, I used to use a certain brand of sriracha sauce. I'm not... I'm not trying to actively throw other products under the bus, but there, there were, there were. There's a lot of sugar in kind of traditional sriracha sauces yeah, and those kind of chili sauces. Um, but I really like that thick consistency, mm-hmm. something that you could like squeeze on, and kind of the sweet spiciness of it. And I tried for a while to find something that was like, uh, we both are trying to eat cleaner. Mm-hmm. You know, like as you start getting older, it gets more important to you know, kind of be, take care of yourself. Be, yeah. Take care of yourself and be mindful of what you're eating and what you're doing. So we were trying to cut out things like added sugars and, you know, preservatives mm-hmm. and just stuff like that. And the hardest thing to get rid of was the, was that sh- sriracha sauce. Mm-hmm. And so I started looking for like, there's gotta be a healthier version or a company that's kind of using. And you started looking at 2012, right? This is, well, it, when I or first started making it, it was like, 2010 2011 okay i was looking for stuff in like 2010 and i was like so the all natural the no preservative stuff is yeah. just starting to ramp up well it's it's certainly like a big deal in the world but it it's may it sort of made its way to condiments slowly yeah and and certainly like in hot sauce it's been even slower mm-hmm. that's sort of one of the, i think in the as i've learned more about it that's sort of one of the places where the um where, where it's slow to catch up to the market, like hot sauce yeah. is not generally a trendy, mm-hmm. you know, like if you're in, if you do coconut water or something and you're not paying attention to trends, then that's, yeah. you know, uh, or I don't know, nut butters, like almond butter or yeah. something like. But, okay, so, so you were, at, going back, you were at your house making this sauce and you're like, I'm not going to put potassium sorbate or xanthan gum here in this yeah. sauce at my house. I'm going to make it normally. Right. I'd make it like normal a normal ingredients. Yeah. Like yeah, stuff yeah. that you would make for your family that like you 
would be happy with like yeah. giving to, that I could like we'd be happy by eating myself. Yeah. And so we were just making it at the house and um I I was kind of like giving bottles to friends of mine and stuff just to like, hey, try this, what do you think? You know, like And they would ask for it, I imagine. Like Yeah, well at first I, I mean the first I don't know, twenty or thirty versions of that sauce were terrible. Really? You know, because it was like a I was trying to figure out, I, I was trying to solve some different problems like consistency, like how do you get, how do you get a good, like thick sauce that's sweet and like savory at the same time without adding all that crazy stuff. Yeah. So there were a lot of different things that I put in there. And, and for a while I was actually fermenting, uh, I was fermenting sauce. Okay. And, uh, and did anybody teach you how to do this stuff? Did your mom teach you how to cook, or was it like uh, just gonna I, start throwing stuff? No, in the well, I got I got into cooking. So my first job ever was I, I cooked at a uh, I was a cook at a um, at a wing restaurant, okay. like a sports bar and grill when I was like fifteen. So you've always been kind of like a hot sauce. Type yeah, of that was my first experience with. Uh, so I was at the I I was cooking at this uh, like sports bar when I was fifteen and. I lied about my age on the application because you technically had to be 19 or 18 or 19 to work in a kitchen Yeah. at the time in Alabama. But like my mom would like come pick me up at two in the morning from working at this job when I was 15 years yeah. old. But it was, they had like a work release program there. And so it was literally, it was me and a bunch of guys who got bust in from like the county jail. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy there from uh, Louisiana, um, this dude named Rhett, who actually had, he had the same mustache that I've got. You guys, can't, you got, you guys you're just listening in. Yeah. I got a big handlebar mustache and that's a, that's a throwback to my buddy Rhett. Um, but he would shoot like the, they had like a 911 sauce or mm -hmm. something that was like the spiciest sauce. And when he was feeling sleepy or like not into it, he would come in and he would do like a shot of yeah. 911 sauce. So that was kind of the, that nice. was my first experience nice. with spicy food. Okay. Um, and then when, when was the moment when you're like, well, you know, people are asking me for this. I'm going to start maybe bottling this in larger quantities. Take it. Did you take it to farmer's markets? Did, so that, well, the first did you already thing, have fans? The first thing, I, I think the first thing that set it off in the story that I kind of like to point to is like, when did, when did we decide to, to make it something more than something we just made at home mm -hmm. was like, I would, I was here, I was playing at bars around town and and I was, you know, letting people try it. And um, there were folks. So at the time, there was a guy, there was a friend of mine who had a uh, corn dog stand mm -hmm. on 6th Street in downtown Austin. Um, and 6th Street in Austin is kind of like the bourbon street of Austin. That's like where everybody goes to so party and go to bars. Playground. Yeah. So like a friend of mine had a corn dog stand on 6th on Street in Austin. And he was like, hey, man, it'd be cool if I like put some of this on, you know, like, put it out at my corn dog stand. And I was like, okay, that's, yeah, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I started like, cause I've made like as a musician in bands and stuff, like I made, uh, several studio albums that, you know, that I was promoting when I came here. And so I was always like playing shows and like, and like, Hey, I got albums for sale. Or, like doing the whole like musician hustle. That, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it kind of slowly became this thing where like, people would come up to me like on my break or something and be like, Hey man, like I enjoyed your tunes. And I'm like, Hey man, I got albums for sale. You guys want an album? I'll give it to you for free. And they're like, no, 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 I don't want an album, but you're that guy who makes, you're the hot <laughs> sauce guy, right? You make the hot sauce. Like my brother told me yeah. he was in here and you had, a, and I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I make hot sauce too, but yeah. and you and, like and, my music though. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, yeah, no, that's cool. That's great. It's really, it's fine. Um, but can I get some of that hot sauce? And so I just, it was one of those things where like, people would come in and be like, do, do you have, do you have hot sauce? And, uh, and so I was selling hot sauce and not selling any albums. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, <laughs> it just kind of like, you know, I'm pretty hard headed. And it was like one of those things where it took, it took a while for it to sort of click. And then I, I kind of came home one day and I was like, I was like, Aaron, what if we like tried to sell hot sauce? Mm -hmm. And at the shows or just not at the shows, just, I mean like the first, year or so like I was just like selling it like I sold I've sold a lot of hot sauce like out of my trunk in parking lots and like <laughs> some shady stuff it's the but, true hustle yeah, it's this hustle but um 
it was really like we started taking it to farmers markets after that mm-hmm. here so in Austin. Here in Austin, okay. yeah. So we uh, we sat down and figured out like what do we want to do? Is so, so Aaron's background is in design and branding, brand management, and stuff like that. I I don't have I don't necessarily have a keen eye for. Mm-hmm. I, I know when I like something, but I don't I, I don't have any training in that in that aspect, and uh, she very much does so there were kind of a lot of conversations and a lot of work around what like what do we want this to be as a brand before we you know this was just to like launch it at a farmer's market and we just thought it'd be a cool um like a cool project to work on together yeah Yeah. for sure and kind of it, it sounds like you guys know knew what you were good at and she was good at these things you were good at these things the roles did the roles kind of like fall normally yeah when we when we had to i mean at first we were just both doing whatever you know like when when it all of a sudden became a thing that we were selling and we would once we did farmers markets we started selling to local restaurants and stuff Mm -hmm. so i'd literally just like spend all week making hot sauce and then drive it around to a handful of restaurants yeah here in town and so we kind of decided that my job was everything inside the bottle and her job was everything kind of outside, outside the, bottle. the bottle nice that's how we defined it for probably the first i mean really that's how we would still define it yeah I think. but that's, that's what's on your resume yeah, i do yeah. and stuff bottle. It, yeah, yeah yeah that's my business card george milton <laughs> yeah inside yellow bird the sauce <laughs> inside the bottle guy nice nice um and then you guys for sure like from day one you're like we're gonna do this all natural there's no reason to add all this funky stuff um we're gonna scale up but i don't want any preservatives and it was kind of like was it a normal realization that you could scale this stuff without adding this ingredient for uh, longevity or this ingredient to make it more uh consistent yeah um i mean i think that in the way that food manufacturing has been looked at for a long time is that, is that you go, and when we started looking at, um, because initially when we started getting in more stores, there's, um, you know, I don't know how much your listeners know about the food industry or how much anybody knows about the food industry, but (laughs) there, there, there are uh, companies out there known as like co-packers or co-manufacturers. So you can take a product to them and it's their kitchen, it's their staff. And they make the product, you know, for you. Yeah. And then you basically like market and distribute it. So when we first started getting into more stores, we we went to some different co-packers. Um, and again, not naming any names, but it's pretty standard in that industry that you bring a product in, and like I would bring I would bring one of these products in, and I would say this is this is what we're making. You know, we use carrots. We use fresh habaneros, we use fresh garlic, Mm -hmm. you know, we're using like citrus juice, organic vinegar, you know, like I was like, here's what we're using. Here's the product we make. Here's the process. And I would hand it off to them and they would do a test batch and they would be like, okay, we, uh, well, instead of carrots, we found this carrot puree product from Del Monte that has 42 (laughs) ingredients in it. And it's like whey protein isolate and, and, Xanthan gum. You have to be a stuff. scientist to understand what's in it. And I'm it. like, that's not, can't you just, like, I just use carrots. Here's a carrot. Yeah, like, <laughs> here's a carrot. Just take this carrot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, cook it and blend it up with, like, some peppers yeah. and stuff. And they're like, oh, well, that's too much processing time. They're like, we just basically want to, like, dump some stuff and mix it up and put it in a bottle. And I went through that a number of times. And we said, well, let's just, let's just find a kitchen space and yeah. make it ourselves. And yeah. so we just, we make it ourselves. Yeah. And I think most co-packers and again, not to dog on any manufacturer, but they're, they're, they're good at the manufacturing side. So they try to minimize costs here, speed up production here. Cause it's not co-packers. It's not just your brand they're dealing with. They're no, dealing no, no. with 20 other brands. Well, and a lot of, and a lot of co-packers, it's a very, it's a, it's a model that's not, that's not optimized to make a better product necessarily. Mm-hmm. So they're generally getting like a tolling charge. So they'll make some set amount per bottle. You know, they'll make 80 cents a bottle or, yeah, yeah. you know, 20, 20 bucks a unit. You know, and there's co-packers for all, not just in the food industry, but I mean like 
electronics and clothing and a lot of for everything yeah, for yeah, everything yeah. like most of the stuff that you buy is not manufactured by the company who's selling it to you even if yeah they kind of position it that way but like you go um, when you go to a co-packer it might be like in the early days we were talking to co-packers who specialized in like hot sauce and salsa and because our product is different it's like this thicker it's not chunky salsa, but it's also not like a thin, you know, like vinegary and hot water, sauce. Yeah, yeah. So the, there, n- nobody was optimized to make this specific product. They were, they were like, well, we can make it as a pepper sauce. We can make it as a chunky salsa. And I'm like, that's not, that's not what, what it want. is. Yeah. It's like, well, in order to, you know, and through no fault of, of these companies, it's like, well, we need, you know, $200,000 of different equipment to make exactly what you're making. Yeah. And so. Jeez. Um, okay. So trying to manufacture hot sauces, that's so for, for those listening and those who don't know, this is a very crowded category in the retail space and yeah. the grocery space and the food service. There's, especially here in the South and Texas, like there's so many hot sauces and you guys were created, creative enough, bold enough to say, we're going to do this. Right. So what kind of, what, what advice or like what, what strengths did you guys play on to say, we're going to go into this crowded category and just totally dominate it? Like what, where was the starting point with that process? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think that we came in and said, I mean, certainly, certainly like we're very optimistic people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think you have to like come in with a certain, you know, any category. I mean, so like any category you can think of is crowded unless you're inventing, you know, a A new category thing. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're inventing protein ice cream or something. Mm -hmm. And now that's a new category. Um, The, I, I think any category it's like, well, if you come in and you're making, anything if you make salsa or hummus or you make a salad dressing or like there's plenty of those out there Um, yeah but the hot sauce hot sauces was there's a lot of hot sauces just like there's a lot of candy bars and a lot of chips i would well i think that i think that what we did was we we came up at, at the in the very early stages like i told you that we planned it out like what does the brand stand for what is the it like what is it all what what are our like what hill are we going to die on with this product? Yeah. And we set just a few, you know, parameters. It's always going to be, you know, this is always going to be the ingredient list. It's Mm -hmm. always going to be natural and healthy. It's going to be food that you can put on your food to make it taste better. Yeah. So you weren't really thinking of competition and like squeezing into a niche. We weren't thinking about like, we're going to make a damn good product. Well, because we, because we didn't come from, we didn't come from the world of retail or manufacturing, or we didn't come from this world where we sat down on day one and worried about the data. We didn't worry about the data on day mm-hmm. one. What we said was like, we're going to make this product and see what happens. And like, we, I mean, we've worked our asses off at every stage of the game. And it's always like, we, you know, like we'll get to, we'll get to a certain level. Okay. We we're in, grocery stores like that was our first milestone was like we were in grocery stores and it was just two like when we when we got into grocery stores it was two grocery stores but it was a milestone because there's there's a lot of things that you have to accomplish you know getting permits getting manufacturing license like going through a review process with the grocery store like figuring out how to you know how to manage like being on the shelf and keeping up with recurring orders and like so it was a milestone getting in two grocery stores and then we said like every milestone we've hit we've kind of said yes and what else like yeah so for for us it's not you know i think that i think that yellow bird's the hot, best hot sauce in the world yeah but i'm pretty biased you know i meet people sure, yeah. i meet people all the time <laughs> that have tried our stuff and they're like well i like this other brand better and i'm like that's fine mm-hmm. right like every like it's a taste thing i mean because our stuff tastes a certain way it you know it's it's a little more expensive than most hot sauces because we use better ingredients yeah. you know because we're not using you know first ingredient like first ingredient water second ingredient xanthan gum third ingredient sugar that's not what our label looks yeah. like 
that those are cheap things to get, yeah. right? And and how would you teach the customer that like this is what we're doing? It's a it's a hot sauce, but it doesn't have all those other ingredients. Did you guys do that through demos, through like online marketing at first? I mean, yes. Like all any pla- any place where people would listen to us, mm-hmm. you know, and there's it's very crowded, so it's hard to it's 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 hard to I think in 2019 it's hard to have really meaningful conversations with people because there's so much, everybody's got so much. There's a lot of conversations going on. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a lot of conversations that honestly are more important than what's your favorite hot sauce. But we just, we just kind of like our strategy is just to stick to what we do really well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do hot, we do hot sauce very well. Yeah. No, no, definitely. That's totally what it seems like. The, and did food service help a lot? Did you guys, because I know whenever I go to stores and do demos, that's so king for us because people are trying it, educating right there and then. But I feel like food service is when someone's sitting down at a restaurant, they can for sure try that, not just on a plastic spoon, but on their food and really. Yeah, yeah. Well, with any condiment, I mean, with anything that's uh, that's additive, because our our stuff is complimentary, like very few people eat hot sauce by itself. Mm-hmm. There, there are plenty of people who do just like those people are all, they're <laughs> all on our Facebook page or all yeah, on Instagram yeah, yeah. Or whatever. So we do, you know, we, we've had people like, like, uh, do like the yellow bird challenge, which is you do like a shot of a, like ghost pepper sauce or whatever, mm. you know, I didn't invent that. It's yeah. just people, <laughs> people, are, fans. yeah, there, there's people that like hot sauce people are crazy people. Yeah. Like, I don't know how many hot sauce people, you know, but I know a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. They're so all, do I. yeah. They're insane. Big fanatics. Uh, but so we, I mean, yeah, like having, having people try, because it's hard to know, it's hard to know if you like a hot sauce or a chimichurri or a ketchup or a mustard. It's hard to know it if you like it, just tasting it by itself. So you mm-hmm. have to put it on, you know, so food service helps, but, uh, you know, demos help. Mm-hmm. Um, but food service is better than demos just because, People can put so, it on yeah. if you come in, if you're like, okay, well, cause like at a demo, we can only, you know, we can only bring one or two things to try mm-hmm. it on. Like here's a chip to yeah. try it, hot sauce on. It's yeah. not like people sit around just like, I'm just going to eat a snack of chips and hot, hot sauce. sauce that, you know, yeah. You got to mix it with some tacos or something. Yeah. I think. But we can't, you know, like it's unreasonable for us to say like, okay, we're going to make Ta- we're going to make tacos to order at a demo for 400 people. For, yeah. By. For four or 500 people. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, well, everybody's got, you know, because we do a lot of natural grocery stores, whole foods mm. and places like that, where you, you have a, a lot more people who have, um, who are particular about their diets. So it's like, if you, if you say, okay, we're going to sample it on eggs, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to have some, we're going to scramble some eggs and like, just try it on eggs. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who shop at Whole Foods who are vegan, yeah, right? Who so they're not eggs, yeah. yeah. Or they're allergic to eggs. Yeah. Or, you know, it's like if you do and we do chips sometimes and it's like, well, are these gluten-free? Yeah, they're gluten-free. Well, not only am I gluten-free, but I also am grain-free. Yeah. It's like, well, so, it's, so you have to get, get a lot of chips. You can't yeah, you can't yeah, get yeah. you you can never like get something get one thing that's going to work for mm-hmm. everybody. So Okay. And um so being a Texas brand have you seen like a lot of support within Texas with, with other brands, manufacturers, marketers, whomever, like what, what are some support systems you've had here that you like about Texas or what are, what are some, uh, some hurdles that you had to get over because you were in Texas? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so hurt, I mean, hurdles wise, you mentioned before that there's a lot of, it's a crowded space. Mm-hmm. Certainly in a place like Texas, there's a lot of sauces, barbecue sauces, hot sauces, salsas. Um, so there's there's competition here. So a mm-hmm. lot of people, you know, people have a lot of different companies doing this sort of stuff that are vying for their attention and vying for, you know, vying for their dollars mm-hmm. at the checkout counter or on Amazon or whatever. Um, but the really cool thing is like in Texas, even... And, and I mean, not just in Texas, but like there, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of other companies in the food space who are making food products who are, you know, who are really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's some people that will, that will be kind of snobby about it and they'll make a product and that's, that's competitive and 
like sometimes it gets sometimes it gets a little dirty yeah out there but like <laughs> I, th- I think by and large and especially in Texas like brands brands are mostly like collaborating and getting along and stuff and we work with a lot of other um, there's a lot of great uh, food makers in Texas mm-hmm. you know yeah. in Austin Houston that's what San we're Antonio. covering here yeah, yeah yeah so you know like Dallas like all over the place there's great food scenes um, both restaurant scenes and manufacturing scenes but uh, we've really enjoyed working with Texas brands mm-hmm. um, we do it all the time. A lot of collaborations. A lot of collaborations. Yeah. We'll do giveaways or we'll collaborate. You talked about demos in stores. Mm -hmm. So we're always like trying to collaborate with other Texas brands on doing a demo or doing an event or Mm -hmm. something like that. Um, And the other thing about Texas is that people in Texas love buying Texas products. Oh yeah. There's a lot of pride here. There's a lot of state pride. And I think every state has a certain amount of state pride, but as much I certainly as Texas, think though. not. I don't. I don't think any state has as much state pride as Texas, and you you guys can fight me on that, but I <laughs> would disagree. I've I've lived in a handful of other states, and and like I, like people just boast about Texas, mm-hmm. and it's all true. Yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you guys don't live in Texas, you're you're missing out. Yeah, um, can you share like an aha moment? you recently had or, uh, or like a, a milestone you guys just reached. Oh man. So those are always the best feelings I'd say. Dude, I feel like I have an aha moment every day. <laughs> I am a, I'm a, I'm a thick headed guy. So yeah. like something will seep through like on a weekly basis, but we did like, as far as milestones, we are, we just launched a organic certified line. Mm-hmm which we were talking about earlier, but not with the microphones on. So we yeah. just, we just uh, launched a certified organic That's this line. this guy, right? Right there. Yeah, right yeah. Now. But there's, th- there's three other flavors. So mm-hmm. we, we launched that um, nationally with Whole Foods. That happened last week. Mm-hmm. So... That was, that's a project that's been literally like five years in the making. It was... Um, it was not an easy thing to do. Yeah. So. You had to get your, your facility certified. And we had to get our facility certified. We also had to find suppliers for organic chilies. Yeah. So we, one of the things that we do that um, that is a little different from from a lot of other hot sauce brands is that we use fresh chilies. Mm-hmm. And that's really difficult. Yeah. So, like from a supply chain logistics standpoint. Um, do you guys roast different. them? Does... All hot sauces, do they roast their? We don't roast ours. Okay. Um, that's a that's a flavor. It's kind of a flavor preference. Okay. Thing. Yeah. Like roasted chilies have a very specific flavor to them. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. But we don't do any roasted. Um, our ghost peppers uh, are smoked. Okay. Which is a little different. You guys smoke them? We don't. Or you get yeah. them smoked? Okay. Yeah, we have them smoked. Nice. Um, so, any. Any specific advice you have for new food entrepreneurs? Because everyone's starting food brands nowadays. But like we said, here in Texas, they're just popping up left and right. Is there some uh, key piece of advice you can share? Uh, I think probably two like really key pieces of advice. Uh, like number number one, be authentic. Because, yeah. because there are so many things out there. There's so many different versions of, and this is not just, not just for food, but for any new brand, I think that it's really important to be, to be authentic and Mm -hmm. specific with what you're doing. Like, don't just put more stuff out into the world, put out, you know, like you were talking about your chimichurri and this is something that, and I know I'm not pronouncing the R's right. You got it. You got it. Chimichurri. Oh yeah. That's, Can you do it one more time? Chimichurri. That's beautiful. You've, you've been in Texas long <laughs> enough. You should have the double R down. I know, I yeah. know, but I'm going to embarrass myself yeah. when I try to do it on the podcast. Anyway, the stuff you make, that stuff that you said several times. Yeah. Um, like you made that you made that for your family growing up when you were a kid. It's very authentic that you would put that out into the world. Um, and I think that that's like the first most important thing. Like don't just, there are a lot of companies who came in and said like, well, the data shows that you know, spicy products are trending and they're on the rise. And so we should manufacture a product, you know, like that's not authentic. Like as many layers of marketing and 
whatever that you put on top of that, like it's not an authentic start yeah. to a brand. And I'm sure there are people who have had monetary success doing something that way. But if you're asking for my advice, I would say yeah. start with authenticity and then don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Like, um, I certainly in Texas, there's a great scene here in Austin. Like I'm fortunate to live in Austin for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is that there are a lot of people who have started great food brands here who I can go ask, you know, we've been able to avoid a lot of potential pitfalls because I could call somebody up and buy them a coffee and say like, Hey, what did you guys, what did you guys do when you launched in grocery stores or what are the things I should try to avoid? Or, you know, I'm running into this problem. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, definitely. I I think the, so those two points are awesome because the authenticity part, I think when you're scaling for long-term success, being authentic and true and passionate, that's kind of the first stage. And then the data analysis and, and the differentiation, I think that's like the second tier stuff where it's like, okay, I love my stuff. People love my stuff. This is my recipe. Now let's see where we really fit in, where we can really squeeze. Let's look at the the data. But I think you're right, like having that authentic and not putting that authenticity and not putting something else out in the world that's already there. Like we don't need another Tabasco. There's already Tabasco, you know. Um, And then the second part, which asks for help, like you said, here in Texas is I think it's key. And everyone is so helpful. And I always say like that's real Southern hospitality. Like you can ask your neighbor or your food neighbor, whomever, like you said, like, oh, what did you do when you got into Whole Foods? Like, what's some strategies there? And everyone seems to be so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And it changes. I mean, everybody's had a different experience. Yeah, and, totally. And all retailers are, you know, adapting and things change drastically every year. Yeah. So it might not be if I go, you know, get advice from somebody about launching and you know, nationally with Whole Foods and they did it two years ago, it might be different now. Yeah, yeah. But they they can certainly like set a framework for, you know, how I think about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the last questions I like asking uh, my guests, and I'm going to ask you this obviously, but how do you, how do you manage um, what you want to do with what you should do with what you have to do? That's a confusing question. <laughs> so what you want to do... <laughs> You want everyone to have your hot sauce. Yep. What you should do is probably scale in an appropriate manner, right? Mm-hmm. And what you have to do is like, well, I have to pay my employees. So kind of in a sense like that, because um, what you want to do, what you should do, and what you have to do, I think are all very different things. Yeah. Huh. Oh, man, I wish I had gotten Is that an Aaron quick. question? No, no. It's <laughs> like, I mean, I think it's a good question. Um, and we've certainly like dealt with, like, how do we manage growth? How do we manage, you know, like managing, managing finances when you are growing, mm-hmm. you know, fast is hard to do because mm-hmm. your expenses next month are going to be very different than your expenses, yeah. expenses this month. Yeah. And I even read one of your, one of your articles about like being able to give something up when you have to. So that, that falls into that question is like, I want to do this, but maybe I should cut ties now and cut my losses now. Yeah, we try to do that. And I think that that's, I think that that, I think it's fairly sort of like popular knowledge in the, in this, in the startup community in general, Mm -hmm. or with the entrepreneur crowd that you want to like, um, fail fast or what is the, what is the term there? (laughs) I I can't remember. I can't remember what it is, but it's fell fast, fell forward or fail Fail fast, fail off. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, there we go. Fail fast, fail off. And so it's, I I mean, with us, it's it's one of those things where like we try lots of different stuff. We've tried different packaging options. We've tried, you know, different strategies with our team. So like growing a team is, uh, especially sales and marketing, like growing growing the team is hard because it's hard to figure out exactly what the next thing you need is. Because you think it's one thing. And then you hire for that, and then it, maybe it's something a little bit different. different. Yeah. And so what we've tried to do is is be very like, just kind of be very honest and accountable, and say like, hey, we're doing this. You know, like I try not to I try not to be too. These are all my recipes, you know. But I try not to be too like 
have too much of a big head about that. It's like, hey, if something, you know, we've released a bunch of small batch stuff along mm -hmm. the way. Some things have been more popular than I thought they were going to be. So like our ghost pepper sauce, for instance, was only supposed to be a small batch thing, but mm -hmm. people kept asking for it and yeah. asking for it. And so it became a regular item. Yeah, of course. But then there's plenty of other things where like we'll release something as a small batch thing and it'll be like, that's, you know, people don't like it. It's not working and we'll have to cut it. And I'll be like, well, yeah. oh, well, that was something cut that didn't the losses. work. Yeah. yeah. So we try to not, you know, not waste more time and money that there's this fallacy of like throw that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of companies do about throwing, throwing a good money after bad, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially when you say, I'm going to stick with this program because I've already invested so much time and money in it. Mm -hmm. And we try not to do that. I think it's irresponsible yeah. for a growing company to be spending of time course. and, you know, very limited resources on something that is not, helpful if you know that it's if you know that it's not helpful then yeah stop doing it yeah. as fast as you can um and then i think you know growing our i don't know managing managing what we have to do with what we want to do we want to make everything you know like of course like it's once you get into the food industry and you probably have experienced some of this yourself you go into the store and we ha we had this experience over you know, the last uh, six, seven years of we went into the store, we said, hey, there's a there's a gap in this hot sauce section. There's something that we want that doesn't exist. And so we created it and it was a big hit. Right. Yeah. So now that is like in my brain I, when I'm like in the store and I want something that doesn't exist. Yet, yeah, 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 of course. And I see it, you know, I see I, and I'll you know, I'll make a recipe for something at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, man, this is, this should be out in the world. And I think we could do this. And I have to check myself like, cause I'm constantly doing R and D yeah. stuff. And the fact that like, I've been making different products at my house, you know, test products like every week for the last seven years. And we only offer this stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, we only <laughs> offer like five things. Yeah. That I think is is a little bit of a testament to like the restraint and focus that we try to yeah. have with what we do. Yeah, I mean, I you know starting a food brand, I lo I love it, and I'm sure like you're just saying right now, it gives us the a reasoning to cook every day, right? It, oh. We can test stuff here and there. So uh, I'm totally glad that there's a lot of people doing that out here in Texas. But um, yeah, no, we're um, going to have to wrap up here, but I want to thank the long center again and Richard's rainwater and brain juice for again, sponsoring us, hydrating us, keeping our brains going. Thanks um, y'all. Yeah. And George pleasure having you on the show. I hope, uh, I hope we're teaching the community community a little bit more about food and manufacturing here in Texas. But, uh, yeah, if you guys haven't tried Yellowbird, go out to your local Whole Foods or some other all-natural stores. They're nationwide, um, and the sauces are kick-ass on pretty much everything. So thank you guys for listening, and um, we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye.